projective morphology was invented by artists. Painters used to show the infinite, the eternal, as the gold ground of existence. In the Renaissance, the gold background of earlier paintings disappears, and in its place, the new manifestation of the absolute becomes the vanishing point. Especially in the Florentine center of the avant-garde. There, Filippo Brunelleschi discovered the vanishing point. One of his exploits was to paint the baptistry so that the painting matched the image of the building in a mirror at the cathedral door opposite. The building's parallels, when extended, converged at the horizon. Brunelleschi must have made his breakthrough around 1413, right on time to inaugurate the age of the consciousness soul. As the painters spread this new way of seeing, the mathematicians took notice. They began to realize how fundamental the consequences were. One of the geeks must have wandered into the Museum of Modern Art by accident and said, what are you guys doing? In geometry, the infinitely distant point was discovered by Kepler and Desargues independently. In perspective drawing and in projective morphology, you shift your point of view. That is a new capacity in the modern age. The ancient Egyptian saw the world with cosmic objectivity. The sides of this pond are parallel. The trees are evenly spaced. All is clear and indisputable. This joker, on the other hand, would have us believe that all the trees of his avenue are roughly the same size, when you can easily measure the largest at twenty times the size of the smallest. The point of view becomes decisive. We shall pass over in silence the shocking loss of vitality in the modern trees. The painter from nature casts her image onto a plane, like a shadow. The scene is three-dimensional. The eye as perspective point is zero-dimensional, where nature vanishes out of space, mediated by one-dimensional rays and the two-dimensional canvas. Now for a simple exercise. Since projective morphology is non-metrical, all you need is a straight edge. And the only technical skills you need are connecting two points and finding the intersection of two lines, in keeping with Proposition 1 from the first installment of this series. Any two points in a plane determine a line, and any two lines in a plane determine a point. That's all there is to it. We arbitrarily choose some points in a line, usually known as a range of points. We might as well include the infinitely distant point, just to keep in practice. Then we cast their shadows, by way of lines, through a perspective point, also arbitrarily chosen, onto some other line. Would you like to picture in advance where the shadows are going to land on the second black line? Then pause now. Easy. Point D, for example, casts its shadow onto the other black line as point D prime. 
Note that your points are still in alphabetical order. That is, they maintain an invariable cyclical sequence. Also note, without the infinitely distant point, there would be a gap in the middle of each line, namely at E prime, and if you were to reverse the process, at C. Your conventional worldview has gaps. We speak of the projective completion of the plane meaning there are no gaps when the infinitely distant point is included. Thus concrete practical work with infinity proves possible. This method of association is called perspectivity. If you want to find the polar procedure, Bearing in mind that this kind of perspectivity is a planar construction, pause now. Perspectivity between two lines, ranges of points, through a point. Each point in the one line is cast onto a point in the other by way of a line in the center of perspectivity. Perspectivity between two points, pencils of lines, through a line. Each line in the one point is cast onto a line in the other by way of a point in the axis of perspectivity. A group of lines in a point is usually called a pencil. No doubt because the word used to mean an artist's paintbrush. Let's construct a perspectivity between two pencils. Here is a pencil of green lines, waiting to be cast into a new pencil in the lower black point. Line D happens to go through both points already. Can you picture or construct the corresponding lines in the lower point? If you want to try, pause now. Here too, without the infinitely distant point, there would be a gap at the middle of each pencil, namely at B and B prime. Sizes and angles change in perspective. Ratios change too, but cross ratio remains. The cross ratio is the ratio of ratios. In this example, that means the quotient of the distances AB and BC divided by the quotient of AD and DC. It remains projectively invariant. You can measure the distances and check that. In other words, from non-metrical procedures, a quantitative lawfulness arises contrary to the inherently contradictory assumption prevalent in the natural sciences since Galileo, that the quantitative generates the qualitative, the morphological, precise yet qualitative, is prior to the quantitative and actually generates it. In this picture, the cross-ratio appears to be about negative one-half. Harmonic conjugates, dealt with two installments ago, have a cross-ratio of one, or if you take directionality into account, negative one. Cross-ratio is metric, so a proof 
that it remains projectively invariant must also be metric. An elegant one, published this year by Stefan Basiner, uses areas of parallelograms. We shall divide everything by two and apply the same reasoning to areas of triangles. Since projectivities consist in concatenations of ranges and pencils, it is sufficient to show that one such linkage maintains cross ratio. The equation begins with the cross ratio of the range. Multiplying everything by half of h gives the areas of four triangles, all with the same altitude. Substitute a different formula for triangle areas, and all the lengths cancel out, leaving the cross ratio of the pencil which is thus equal to the cross ratio of the range. Note that the lengths cancel out only with cross ratio, not with simple ratios. You can take a whole house and send it into a point, and it will come out the other side, maybe flipped, maybe warped. Right angles and fixed measurements give solid ground, perspectivities shift and float. Visual space is different from tactile space, as Gerhard Kienle, Norman Davidson, and others have shown. You can also cast points in a plane by way of a perspective point which meets them in lines to points in another plane, or cast planes in a point by a way of a perspective plane which meets them in lines to planes in another point. You can cast lines in a plane by way of a perspective point which meets them in planes, to lines in another plane. Or cast lines in a point by way of a perspective plane, which meets them in points, to lines in another point. You can cast planes in a line by way of a perspective line which meets them in points to planes in another line. Might as well include the infinitely distant point, just to keep in practice. Or cast points in a line by way of a perspective line which meets them in planes to points in another line. And there are other kinds of perspectivities, too. Now back to some planar figures. The following considerations do apply equally to spatial morphology. A sequence of perspectivities is called a projectivity. We move, for instance, from point to line, to point to line, to point, in a breathing rhythm of expansion and contraction. In this figure, A is perspective to A prime through the red axis on the left, and A prime is perspective to A double prime through the second red axis. Therefore, A is projective to A double prime. Quiz. Given three points, A, B, and C, in a line, and their corresponding points, A double prime, B double prime, and C double prime, in another line, 
find a projectivity that associates them. It helps if you construct it yourself with a straight edge. Feel free to pause now. First, connect one projective pair directly. Here we have chosen A and A double prime. Then choose any two points in the line A, A double prime. These will be perspective points. Now all that is missing is a perspective line. It is easy to find. Spoiler alert! Just connect one perspective point with B and C and the other with B double prime and C double prime. In the intersections of corresponding lines, determine the perspective line at the middle of the projectivity. Now we can project a fourth point, D, to D double prime. Note that if we choose different perspective points, D double prime remains unchanged. In other words, once three correspondences are set, all are. That is known as the fundamental theorem of projective geometry in its specific formulation for formations of the first order. And the polar construction, given three lines A, B, and C in a point, and their corresponding lines A double prime, B double prime, and C double prime in another point, find a projectivity that associates them. First, connect one projective pair directly. Here we have chosen A and A double prime. Then choose any two lines in the point A, A double prime. These will be perspective lines. Now all that is missing is a perspective point. It is easy to find. Spoiler alert. Just connect one perspective line with B and C and the other with B double prime and C double prime. And the connections of corresponding points determine the perspective point at the middle of the projectivity. This course mainly uses visual evidence and drawing. But the fundamental theorem deserves a proof. Namely, it is to be proved that if two different series of perspectivities project three elements A, B, C to three elements A double prime, B double prime, C double prime, both projectivities project any fourth element D to one and the same fourth element D double prime. We shall show this using the example of projective ranges of points. If we assume that in all or part of the segment A double prime, B double prime, which does not contain C double prime, the two projectivities diverge, a contradiction arises. We call their points of convergence just to the right and left of the segment where they diverge, P double prime and Q double prime. If nowhere else, such convergent points at least exist at A double prime and B double prime, according to the presupposition. The harmonic conjugate D double prime of C double prime with respect to P double prime and Q double prime must then lie in the segment 
where the two projections diverge. But this cannot be, since harmonic ranges always project to harmonic ranges, as shown two installments ago. And so C, P, D, Q must project to C double prime, P double prime, D double prime, Q double prime in both projectivities and likewise for the other segments. In case you want more challenges, try these. Given three points in a line and three lines in a point, construct a projectivity that associates them. The labeling of the lines in this example is a little hint. Given three points in a line and three other points in the same line, construct a projectivity that associates them. This will help later when we look at involution. So will this, given three lines in a point and three other lines in the same point, construct a projectivity that associates them. Still too easy? How about projecting some planes 